Coming up on Doctype, charts, graphs, and diagrams, oh my! We'll be taking a look at all the different options you have for fancy charts and graphs on your web pages. Then, graphs are no good if they don't make any sense. We'll share some best practices for these crazy quantitative visuals. So grab your color wheel and your turbo encabulator because Doctype starts now. This episode of Doctype is made possible by Scrum and Less Everything. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that wants to learn a little bit of JavaScript or a developer that thinks everything they make looks like crap, Doctype is here to show you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help you take your next project to the next level. All right, so here we are on episode two. Episode two, we made it, for, we made it past the first big episode. We've tried to listen to as much feedback as possible. And uh, we're actually on iTunes now. So if you're on doctype.tv, you can see a little iTunes icon right below the video. And if you're elsewhere, you can go to doctype.tv slash iTunes and subscribe to our, uh, our show that way. We also have our RSS feed set up. So if you want to just follow the episodes any other way, it's right there for you. Yeah. So without further ado, what are we going to be talking about today? Today we're talking about charts and graphs in our web pages. All right. Let's get into it. Sometimes the best way to make a point is to use a graph. But until the W3C considers a line graph tag, what tools do we have to create them? We'll show you four ways to create graphs in your web pages. Our first option comes from Google. The Google Charts API lets you dynamically create charts by using URLs with your data and your options encoded into it. The URLs point to Google servers and they'll return you an image with your graph on it. Because Google charts are all based on images, it means you don't have to have any special plugins or even have JavaScript enabled. It'll be available from any browser that can render images and reach google.com. The Google Charts API offers line, bar, and pie charts, Venn diagrams, scatter plots, radar charts, meters, and QR codes. Wait, what are QR codes? QR codes are like 2D barcodes. You can encode data into them and read them out with a visual scanning device. I don't have any real use for it, but it's pretty fun to play with. The scheme for encoding the data relies on a lot of abbreviated options, so you're going to be looking at the documentation a lot. Fortunately, there are a lot of libraries that abstract all that away, and they're available on pretty much every language. All right, so the pros. First, it's hosted by Google, so you don't have to worry about hosting or bandwidth. Second, it's image-based, so it's pretty much usable anywhere. And third, there's a lot of configuration options. You can really customize all of your charts. The cons. Uh, because they're images, they're not so interactive. And you're also depending on Google's servers to be up. So if they go down, your charts won't be available. Our second solution is Graphail. Graphail is a solution that uses JavaScript and the Canvas tag to render your charts. Now, don't worry about IE's lack of support for the Canvas tag, because almost all JavaScript-based charting solutions include a hack that will make Canvas work in Internet Explorer. Graphail supports line, bar, pi, and dot graph types. All these graph types are, can be made interactive too. While it may not have the greatest number of graph types and styling options, I really like Graphail because it's built on the Raphael JavaScript library, which offers an easy to use API for drawing on the canvas. You can build some really great stuff with Raphael alone, but the Graphail toolset allows you to build quick, interactive charts based on Raphael. So the pros, it's interactive, it's compatible with several mobile browsers. There's no external dependencies like in Google Graphs, and it's highly customizable. In the cons, there's fewer built-in graph types, it's a fairly young project, and there's no formal documentation available yet, but the source code of the examples are great. One of the libraries that has been getting a lot of attention lately is the High Charts library, and for good reason. High Charts offers line, scatter, area, bar, and pie charts, and you can combine several types of chart into one. It features chart animations, multiple themes, and tons of options for both the layout and style of your graphs. High Charts is free for non-commercial use, but if you want to use it in a commercial site, you're going to need an $80 single site license. The pros. There's a wide variety of chart types and styles. You have the ability to mix multiple series of data and chart types together and it has some pretty nice animations. The cons, it's not completely free, and it's not open source. 
Our last solution that we'll look at are the charting components from the ajax.org JavaScript library. Now I have to warn you, the ajax.org JavaScript library is pretty new and it's kind of buggy. I wasn't able to get it to even load in Internet Explorer 6. Yeah, I, I tried it on my iPhone and I wasn't able to get it to load there either. <laughs> well, all that said, it's worth a look just to see the 3D graphs that they have. They have a 3D line graph and a 3D area chart that are unlike anything I've ever seen done in JavaScript. I encourage you to go and look at the demos yourself on ajax.org. The pros. It's visually stunning, it's animated and interactive, and come on, it's in 3D. Cons. There's some compatibility issues, it's somewhat buggy, and there's a pretty steep learning curve. So these are just a few of the options. We didn't even cover any of the flash-based solutions or server-side image generating solutions that you can use. We wanted to focus on open web standards that can create charts inside the browser. And even though we didn't cover all the options out there, if you have a favorite, let us know what it is in the comments. If you're working on projects, you want to stay organized and make sure you're working on the right things. That's where Scrums can help. Scrum uses Scrum methodology to help you plan your work and make sure you keep on delivering. Drag and Drop Everywhere makes quick work of adding releases, sprints, user stories, and tasks. Scrum also allows you to designate your product owner, your Scrum Master, and Scrum team members, and it brings full transparency to all your projects. Get started for free with the Indie Plan over at scrums.com. All these graphing libraries are awesome, but if you're using graphs on your web pages, you should make sure that they're clear and well thought out. Let's dive in. Graphs can be a lot of fun, but you want to make sure that you're using graphs to simplify information rather than overcomplicate it. In other words, don't just use a graph to use a graph. Additionally, you want to use a graph when you have more than one dimension of data to represent. For example, if you want to represent the number of visitors to your web page, just represent it as a number. But if you want to represent the number of visitors to your web page over time, that's when it's time to start thinking about visuals. Now, just as you shouldn't use a graph just to use a graph, you shouldn't use color just to use color. When people look at a graph, they assume that the color has some sort of meaning. Now, to give you a very specific example, when you're using a pie chart, you want to differentiate the different pieces from one another, and a great way to do that is with color. In a bar graph, it probably doesn't make as much sense to make each bar in the same series all different colors. But the exception to this is when a bar graph has multiple series, and two bars are side by side on the same data point. Now, lastly, I'd like to note that because the colors in a graph are so close to one another, you want to make sure that the colors are different enough that you differentiate the different pieces in the graph. But you don't want to make them so different that the colors clash really badly. Now, color is a huge topic, and we'll be talking a lot more about it in future episodes, I'm sure. But for now, we'll just give you some links to color resources in the show notes. So basically, I shouldn't put pink and green bars right next to each other, right? Something like that. <laughs> My advice with backgrounds is pretty simple. Just don't do it. I personally feel that backgrounds are just way too distracting to any kind of data that you're trying to represent. Now, if you want to use a solid color or a subtle gradient or maybe some shadows, that might be okay. But once you start getting into pictures and fuzzy clouds and things, that's when it starts to get really distracting. There are tons of ways to visualize data, and this topic goes way beyond a single episode of Doctype. But here are some quick pointers. Think about your data in terms of dimensions. If your data is simple, pick the simplest graph that could possibly work. A big complicated chart may make you feel big and important, but typically it's probably more than you need. Don't use a pie chart if the data you're representing adds up to more than 100%. Now, I know that sounds silly, but it can easily happen if you're discussing demographic data. Fortunately, Google Charts has some nice Venn diagrams. When you're trying to show a trend over time, a line graph is usually best. Of course, you could use a bar graph, but really the choice depends on how easy the trend is to spot. With a line graph, the points are connected to each other, which helps interpolate the data. If you want to learn more about graphs, I highly recommend the Visual Display of Quantitative Information by Edward Tufte. Check out the show notes for a link to the book on Amazon. 
Do you want more out of life? And what you really need is less. Less everything. Less everything are two cool cats that do cool stuff like less projects, easily manage multiple projects, prioritize tasks, and assign tasks to people. Less accounting. The accounting app for small businesses to save you pain and suffering. Less time spent. Track your time and avoid billing mistakes. And of course, less comp. Jim and I went to less comp in 2009 and 2010 should be even better. To learn more, check them out at lesseverything.com. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Doctype. Be sure to stop by our Facebook fan page and follow at Doctype TV on Twitter. Also, if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And as many of you requested, we recently added an RSS feed and we're now on iTunes, so be sure to subscribe. So until next Tuesday, remember, every great webpage starts with Doctype.